Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about transformations of functions. By now we're familiar with a variety of different functions, things like x, x squared, square root of x, absolute value of x, etc, etc. We've seen a bunch of different fundamental parent functions, that function petting zoo we visited in the last lesson. However, we often have to work with or graph functions that are similar to these fundamental functions, but not precisely the same. They're not the ones we're already familiar with exactly. Many times the difference is the result of a transformation. So a transformation is a shift, a stretch, or a flip of a function. Now, when I say that, I mean that graphically. It's been moved either left, right, or up, down. It's been stretched either horizontally or vertically, or it's been flipped or flipped vertically or horizontally. Understanding transformations is useful for working with functions or building our own functions if we want to build one from scratch. For this lesson, we'll begin by looking at vertical shifts and stretches because they're the easiest ones to graph. It's easiest to understand moving things around vertically. Then we'll learn how horizontal shifts and stretches work and what we've understood in vertical will give us a slightly better understanding of what's going on horizontally. And finally, we'll look at flips. All right, let's go. Very first one, vertical shift. This is the easiest one of all. To shift vertically, you simply add to a function. Positive numbers shift up, negatives shift down. So let's see an example. Consider f of x equals x squared graphed with f of x plus 2 equals x squared plus 2 and f of x minus 7 which equals x squared minus 7. So f of x equals x squared, our base function, is the red part of our graph. If we want to see what f of x plus 2 is, that's the blue graph. And finally, the green graph is f of x minus 7. So notice, if we just take a function and we add 2 to it, it gets raised by 2 units. The height goes up to 2, right? It goes up to here. But if we take the function and subtract 7, f of x minus 7, which would be x squared minus 7, it goes down by 7. It goes, it goes lower for off of its base of, you know, normally starting at 0, 0, x squared has its home base in a way at 0, 0. It drops down by 7, or we can raise it up. So we can move it up and down with this vertical shift. What's going on? Think about it like this. If we want to move one point vertically, we would add k to its vertical component, its y value. So let's say hypothetically, we want to change the point 1, 2. We want to move it up by 5. So if we want to move it up by 5, we just add 5. We'd have 1, 2 plus 5, which would be 1, 7, right? That's what we'd get if we wanted to move it up by 5. So to move up one point, we just add k or subtract k, but let's think of it as adding a negative k. So we add k, and if k is positive, it goes up. If k is negative, it goes down. So that moves one point up. If we want to move all of the points in a graph, then we have to add this to all of the verticals, all of the vertical components. Now remember, the vertical components of a function's graph is the function's output. So the function's output, we just need to make the output be k more, or k less if it's a negative number. So we add k to it. We just change the output everywhere by adding k to the function. So if we start off with f of x, and we want to vertically shift by f, we just use f of x plus k. If k is positive, it moves up. If k is negative, it moves down. Simple as that. So f of x plus k. We take our original function, and we add k to it, and we've got a vertical shift of k units. Great. Next, vertical stretch shrink. If we want to vertically stretch or shrink a graph, we want to pull it, stretch it, or we want to shrink it, we want to squish it, we multiply the function by a multiplicative factor a. If 0 is less than a, which is less than 1, a is between 0 and 1, the graph will shrink. If a is greater than 1, the graph stretches. So let's see an example. Consider f of x equals x squared, so that's the one in red. That's our basic function that we're starting with to have a sense of how things are going to go. And then we compare that to 3 times f of x. It has a multiplicative factor of 3 hitting it. So in this case, whoops. So in this case, we've got the graph stretching because it's 3 times f of x, so a is greater than 1. And indeed, this one right here has been stretched up. We have the parabola normally, but we instead sort of grab it and pull it up higher. So if we look at this, every point here is 3 higher. Here is 1, 2, 3 higher to get up to there. If we compare that to the shrinking in the green graph, we've got a is less than Sorry, a is equal to 1 third, so 1 third is between 0 and 1, so it's been shrunk. It's been squished down. So where we are at the red, we go to a third of where we are at the red, 
and we find ourselves on the green one. So it's been squished by a factor of one third. So we can either stretch it with a larger than one factor or squish it with a less than one factor, but not in the negatives. We'll talk about negatives later. What's going on? First, when we say stretch shrink, it means we're grabbing a point and pulling or pushing it away from or toward the x-axis. So for example, let's say we've got the point 1 comma 2. And we want to multiply some multiplicative, we want to apply some multiplicative factor to the point's height. So its height is just 2. So if a equals 1 half, then we get 1 comma 2 times 1 half. So we get 1 comma 1. We have halved the point's height, right? If we are at 1 comma 10, it would become 1 comma 5. We are squishing by a factor of 1 half. We could also expand by a factor of a equals 7, and it would get multiplied by 7. So we've got this multiplicative factor either pulling it apart if it's greater than 1 or squishing it together if it's less than 1. If we want to do this to all the points in the graph of a function, we need to apply that multiplicative factor to all of the function's outputs. To do it to all the function's output, we need to multiply the function itself. We multiply the function by a. So that will apply it to all the outputs, because the function tells us where the outputs go. So if we multiply something against the function, it will have done it to all of the possible outputs that will come out of that function. So to stretch shrink a function by a multiplicative factor a, we use a times our function, a times f of x. If a is greater than 1, the function stretches. If a is between 0 and 1, it shrinks. And finally, if a is equal to 1, then it doesn't do anything. It has no effect because we're between stretching and shrinking. We're exactly on the middle, and we're just left with the function as it was before. It has no effect. We've grabbed it and then just immediately let go instead of pulling or pushing it together. Horizontal shift. This is a little more complex than vertical shift, but we're ready to talk about this now. To shift horizontally, we need to change where the function sees x equals 0. We do this by plugging something different than x into the function. And what I mean by that is you can take, for example, a normal line, right? Normal f of x equals x kind of line. Well, if we want, we could say that in a way, its home base is this zero point, right, where it crosses that axis. It's where it sees zero in the x-axis. But we could also talk about another graph where it's the same line but shifted over to the right. Well, what's happened there is we've taken this home base and we've shifted it over by some amount, right? We've shifted it over by, the same, by some amount. So we have the same picture, but it's been moved to the right. We are seeing the home base, the effective x equals 0, in a different place. That's the idea we want to bring to this. Consider f of x equals x squared. So once again, we see that in red, graphed with f of x minus 4 equals x minus 4 squared. That one is in blue. It's been shifted 4 units to the right. And f of x plus 2, and that one is in green, x plus 2 squared. It's been shifted two units to the left. Now, that might seem counterintuitive at first, right? Minus 4 causes us to shift to the right, but plus 2 causes us to shift to the left. So to understand what's going on, we need to think about this a little more deeply. What's going on? Think about it like this. The graph of a function is a way to look at how the function sees the x-axis, right? A graph is where an input gets placed as an output. That's at least one way to interpret a graph, and it's how we're doing it for functions. So if we are looking at a graph, it's how it sees the entire x-axis, at least all the x-axis in our viewing window at once. That x-axis is mapped to some sort of curve. It takes in each x value in the x-axis and it outputs a y value. A graph shows us how the function is seeing all of the x-axis at the same time. Now normally, we plug in just x, right? So the x-axis looks like your normal number line. 0 in the middle, 1, 2, 3 out, negative 1, 2, 3 out in the other direction. So 1, 2, 3, negative 1, 2, 3, it's exactly what we're used to. It's your normal number line. But we can move this number line around. We can move this home base. So currently our home base of 0, think about it as a home base for now, 0 is in the middle when we plug in just x. How do we move around that home base? We move it around like this. So normally, once again, our normal plain x normal number line we can move it around by plugging in x plus k. For example, if k equals negative 2, then our normal home base now, it's k, it's x minus 2, so it's 0 minus 2, and we get negative 2. 1 minus 2, and we get negative 1. 2 minus 2, and we get 0. And hey, look, our home base has shifted 2 units 
to the right, right? We've gone over one, two clicks over to the right. And everything has been moved by this amount, right? We've got the minus two on everything. And so that's how we're getting all of these new points. But we've got what we've got by doing this is we've shifted, you've effectively shifted over the location of home base. We've effectively shifted over the location of x equals zero by subtracting two from everything. Since everything is now two lower, we had to go where we originally had two to now just have zero, to be back in our usual home base. So I want to say this once again, graph shifts to the right with a negative. So if we plug in a negative for k, this x plus k here, if we plug in a negative, we get shifting to the right because we're taking that much away from all the numbers. And so if we're taking them away, it has to be the high numbers, the traditionally right side numbers that are now going to have our new home base in them. So shifting to the right, horizontal shifts to the right happen with a negative value for k. What if we wanted to shift to the left? Well, we could plug in a different x plus k. So different x plus k, if we plug in k equals 3, then if we've got plus 3, we now have 3 for our old 0. We have to go to negative 3 for us to get our home base back, right? So it's now 1, 2, 3 over to the left for us to get from our old home base to our new home base, right? And everything's going to get hit by this plus 3, which is why we've got 6 over here and all these sorts of things. So by adding a positive number, it is the lower numbers, the negative numbers, that are now going to wind up taking the place of having the home base be on that side. So the home base will move to the left if we have a positive k. So if we want to shift to the left, we use positive for k, and that x plus k. Great. Therefore, we can shift around where the function sees x equals 0, this idea of seeing x equals 0, seeing our home base and the rest of the x-axis in turn, is by plugging in x plus k instead of just plugging in x. By shifting around the perceived x-axis, by shifting around this perceived home base, the graph will move horizontally, will move to the left, move to the right. Now notice this doesn't actually change the x-axis, it just changes the way the function sees it. The x-axis is still going to look totally normal to us, it'll be that normal x-axis that we're used to, but the way the function will interact with it is now based off of this new home base because of us plugging in that x plus k. So to horizontally shift a function by k units, we use f of x plus k, and if k is a positive, we shift left. If k is a negative, we shift right. Now remember, that seems a little bit counterintuitive at first, but if you think about why it's the case, if we put in a positive number, it has to be the negative side that establishes the new home base, the new zero. If we put in a negative number, then it has to be the positive side, the right side, that establishes the new home base, the new zero. So it seems a little counterintuitive, but you think about it through that, think about those slides, those ideas we just saw, and you go, oh yeah, it makes sense that I'm plugging in the positive to go left, plugging in the negative to go right. All right, horizontal stretch. So this idea is similarly complex, but now that we understand how horizontal shifting worked, this will probably make more sense. To horizontally stretch or shrink a function, that is to pull it apart or to squish it together, we need to change how fast the function sees the x-axis. Once again, it's not really literally seeing it. The function isn't a living, breathing thing, but the way that it's going to interact with it, we can effectively personify it and pretend that it's alive for this. Effectively, we need to stretch shrink how the function perceives x. We need to change the way that the function will interact with that x-axis. So let's look at some examples first. f of x equals x squared, our normal red graph. Let's try if we've put in 3 times x instead. We've put that multiplicative factor on the x, and we get 3x squared. Our blue graph, we plug in 1 half times x, 1 half x quantity squared, our green graph. All right, so let's understand what's going on here. What's going on? This idea is very much like what we did with horizontal shift. We're playing with how the function sees the x-axis. Once again, remember, if we plug in just x, we get this guy, our normal number line. 0 in the middle, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3 to the left, 1, 2, 3 to the right. Great. Just like normal. But we can shift, we can speed this up. We can speed or slow down the experience of this number line. If we plug in an x-axis that has been stretched or shrunk by a multiplicative factor a, so if we have a times x, so for example, if we have 3 times x, we speed it up, right? Instead of 0 to 1, it's now 0 to 3, right? So 0 to 3, and then 3 to 6, and of course 1 and 2 are still in there, but they've gotten shrunk down. We're speeding up how fast we're moving through the numbers. 
So each number effectively has been multiplied by 3. We're moving through the numbers faster, which will condense the graph. The graph will be happening faster horizontally, so it's going to go through what it would do normally faster. We can also expand it by slowing it down with a small a. If we put in a small a, like 1 half times x, we go from 0 to 1, and now we're 0 to 1 half. We have to take two steps forward before we even manage to make it to 1, so now we're going at a speed that is half the speed originally. We are slowed down by a factor of 2. Okay. So by applying a multiplicative factor a to x, we can change how fast the x-axis looks to the function. This change in horizontal speed either stretches or shrinks the graph horizontally. If it looks faster, the graph will compress because it has the same amount of things happening in a shorter amount of x time. If it is stretched, then it's going to wind up, if we slow it down, it will be stretched because it takes more x time to be able to get through the same information. And like before, this doesn't actually change the x-axis that we see, it's just how the function will interact with the x-axis. So to horizontally stretch, shrink a function by a factor of a, we use f of quantity a times x. We fiddle with how that x-axis works. We change around the speed that that x is moving at. So if a is greater than 1, it will shrink horizontally because we've sped up. So a greater than 1, it shrinks horizontally because it's speeding up how fast the x-axis goes. We want to think about that in terms of speeding up. It makes it easier to understand what's going on. So if we speed it up by putting in a large a, a greater than 1, we're going to shrink horizontally because more stuff will happen in the same period of time. 0 less than a less than 1, we are going to stretch horizontally. It will slow down the x-axis because we now have to go through a longer interval, a longer amount of x time for us to be able to get the same inter information through. So a greater than 1 shrinks horizontally. Sorry, a greater than 1 shrinks horizontally. It speeds up. If a is between 0 and 1, it stretches horizontally. It slows down. All right. Vertical flip, which we might also call mirroring vertically or a vertical mirror. To vertically flip a graph around the x-axis, we simply multiply the function by negative 1. It's as simple as that. We just multiply the function. So if we have f of x equals x squared in good old red, then we can flip it vertically by just multiplying by a negative 1. So negative f of x, which is negative x squared, and it flips to pointing in the opposite direction. What's going on here? Well, if we wanted to flip a single point around the x-axis, say we've got 1 comma 2 again, if we wanted to flip it around the x-axis to the opposite height, then we would just multiply the vertical component, the y value, by negative 1, right? So vertical times negative 1 would become 1 comma 2 times negative 1, or 1 comma negative 2. We have flipped that point to the opposite vertical location, the opposite height. This sends it to the opposite side, but it still has the same height in terms of distance from the x-axis. It's now a negative height, or if it started off negative, it'll be now be positive. For example, we could have, say, 3 comma negative 7, and that would flip to 3 comma positive 7, right? So we're flipping from one side to the other side. If we want to do this to all the points in the graph of a function, we need to apply it to the entire function, right? The vertical components are the outputs of the function, so we need to make the function output the negative version everywhere. We do this by just multiplying the whole function by negative 1. So to flip a function vertically around the x-axis, that is, if we've got, you know, smiley face here, then it will become reversed smiley face here. It is flipped vertically. Does to flip a function vertically around the x-axis, we use negative f of x. Great. To horizontally flip a graph around the y-axis, we change how the function sees the x-axis to its opposite. We need to flip its perception of the x-axis. Just like we changed perception of the x-axis with horizontal shift and horizontal stretch, we're going to do that for horizontal flip. We do this by plugging in negative x. Let's see an example. Consider f of x equals square root of x. So if we've got root x, then that's the red graph. We couldn't use x squared because its horizontal flip will just look like the exact same thing. And we'll graph that with f of negative x. So we plug in negative x and we'll get negative root x, which winds up pointing in the exact opposite direction. Why is it pointing in the exact opposite direction? Well, if we try to plug in a positive number, like say positive 6, square root of negative 6, if we plug in x equals 6, it's going to get a square root of negative 6, which does not exist, right? Does not exist. So 
it doesn't exist on the right side, just like square root of x, normal square root of positive x, doesn't exist on the left side. So our blue graph has to go in the opposite direction because it sees negative 6 as being the same height as the red one sees positive 6. All right. What's going on here? How is this working? We're reversing how the function sees the x-axis. So normally, once again, we see x going off to the right and to the left, just like usual. But if we plug in negative x, it reverses. So let's put some color here so we can see what I'm talking about. So if we have on our normal positive x version, it goes to the right in red, and it goes to the left in blue. When we plug in negative x, we see it goes to the right in blue, and the left in red, right? If we hit 3 by negative 1, it becomes negative 3. Negative 3 by negative 1, it becomes positive 3. So we've flipped the order that the x-axis occurs in, right? As opposed to from going negative to positive, it now goes from positive to negative. We've flipped the order that it occurs in. So to flip a point horizontally around the y-axis, we need to just multiply the horizontal component by negative 1. For example, our good old point 1 comma 2, if we want to flip horizontally, then we're just going to look at the negative version of the x-axis. So we'd go to negative 1, 2. Right? So this will move the point to the opposite horizontal location. If we plug negative x into a function, it reverses how it sees the x-axis throughout. So we'll be plugging in opposite horizontal locations everywhere, so everything will flip to the opposite horizontal location. All the points are going to show up in the opposite horizontal location because we plugged in this negative x. So to flip a function horizontally around the y-axis, we use f of negative x. So what does that mean? So once again, say we have some smiley face over here. So smiley face, smiley face sadly doesn't have a, you know, anything left right. He's a perfect left right thing. So let's make smiley face. It's now Ms. Smiley face and Ms. Smiley face has a little bow. So if we flip her around the y axis, we flip her horizontally, she will so show up on the other side and her face will look the same because her face is mere symmetric horizontally, but now her bow is going to be on the opposite side. Right? So she shows up on the opposite side now. She's been mirrored horizontally around the y-axis. Here's a summary of transformations. I know it is a lot of different transformations that we've seen at this point, so don't worry if you have to refer back to this list later on. Also, if you currently have some sort of book that you're working on along with this course in, or if you have another teacher who's working in a book, you're almost certainly going to be easily able to find a table of these in any section where they'd be teaching the same stuff in that book. So this table is really useful because it can be a little hard to remember all of them right off the bat. Vertical shift is f of x plus k. k is positive, causes us to go up. k is negative, causes us to go down. Vertical stretch is a times f of x. If a is between 0 and 1, it shrinks it. If a is greater than 1, it stretches it. Horizontal shift is putting in, you plug in x plus k. k is positive, we go to the left. k is negative, we go to the right. Horizontal stretch is 0 to 1, means we slow down, and slowing down means as we stretch out. a greater than 1. Did I say horizontal stretch? f of a times x. I'm not quite sure I said that. a greater than 1 causes us to go faster, which means we squish together. Vertical flip, we flip over vertically. That's negative f of x. Horizontal flip, f of negative x causes us to flip horizontally. One thing to notice, all the vertical stuff happens outside function, right? Happens outside the function. If it's vertical shift, it's f of x plus k. If it's vertical stretch, it's a times f of x. If it's vertical flip, it's negative times f of x. Everything's doing it on the outside of the function. However, horizontal, horizontal stuff happens inside, right? Horizontal shift is you plug in x plus k. x plus k goes into the function. Um, horizontal stretch is a times x goes into the function. Horizontal flip is negative x goes into the function. So horizontal things will happen inside the function, happens to what we're plugging into the function, whereas vertical stuff happens on the outside of the function. We don't have to worry about it being plugged in. 
Okay, that's a summary of transformations. Don't worry if you have to refer to this, but you can also probably think about this sort of stuff. Now that we've got an understanding of where this stuff is coming from, you can probably actually figure out, oh, it makes sense this, and just re-figure it out, re-derive it in your own head without even having to refer to these lists. Horizontal shift, horizontal stretch, horizontal flip, they might be a little bit more difficult, but remember that idea of we're shifting around our home base. We're shifting around the experience of the x-axis. That's what we're shifting with those. Stacking transformations. If you want to do multiple transformations on one function, you just apply one transformation after another. But order matters. So unlike when we multiply and divide and multiply, like if I multiply 5 by 3 by 7 by 8, multiply all those numbers together, it doesn't matter what order I multiply them in. But transformations, it matters the order you put the transformations on. Be careful. You want to order the order you apply your transformations can affect the results. So the order you apply will affect how it comes out. Not always, but a lot of the time. Decide on the order you want before you do it. So decide on the order. Then apply them to your base function in that order. So the order that they get, they hit that base function, the order that they do their transformations will change what happens. So there are some cases where it won't matter the order you put it on, but other times you're going to get totally different results, and we'll look at an example in just a second. This means you have to think about order when doing multiple transformations. So make sure you think about order if you're doing multiple transformations, because if you don't think about it, you can really get screwed up and get completely the wrong answer. All right, so let's look at an example of why it matters how we stack our transforms, the order that we put our transformations on. So for example, let's consider f of x equals square root of x. And just in case you've forgotten what that looks like, it starts at the origin and just sort of goes out like that and slowly increases the farther it goes out. All right, let's say we want to move it two units right and flip it horizontally. So we move it two units right by plugging in x minus 2 into where we have x. And we flip horizontally by plugging that negative x in here as well. So that's how we do the two different things. We plug in negative x into the function or we plug in x minus 2. Look at how order matters. So we get very different things depending on the order we put this in. So if we move and then we flip, so then first we would move, right? We'd plug in x minus 2 first so we'd get square root of x minus 2. And then we do the next action is flipping. So we then plug in negative x next. So negative x will go in to where we have x. So we'll get square root of negative x minus 2. So that gives us a function g of x equals square root of negative x minus 2, which would look like this graph right here. And that makes sense because I think this is the, uh, the direction of right for you guys. For me, it's my left, but hey. So if we've got square root going out like this, right, and then we pick it up and we move it over, well, the middle is still here, right? It used to be coming directly out, but we picked it up and we moved it over. So when we flip it, it's going to be a farther distance over now and going out the opposite direction. And that's what we see here on this red graph. We see that it is away from the y-axis because it moved away from the y-axis and then it flipped. It turned all the way over it, right? basically grabbed it like a pole and spun to the other side. So now it is two away, but negative two. What if we did flip and then move? If we did flip and then move, first thing we do is we'd plug in the negative x first. So negative x would go in first, and then into that x, we would plug in x minus 2. So x minus 2 goes in there. So we've got x minus 2 is now replacing the x. And as right, we're plugging into the function. We're just plugging inside of that x. Remember, it's just a placeholder. It's not actually the, it doesn't really mean that we've got just x allowed to be there. It's just a placeholder for f of blank equals square root of blank. And so if we want to flip horizontally, we plug in negative x. If we want to move units right, we move x minus 2. So flip, then move. We've got square root of negative x. And then the next thing, we put in the move. So we plug into that x and x minus 2 instead of x. So we've got negative quantity x minus 2. So that gives us the function h of x equals square root of negative x plus 2 because the negative cancels out the minus sign. So that's going to start at positive 2 and then move off to the right. So it starts at positive 2 and moves to the right. Once again, this makes sense. We've got this sort of center post of the y-axis, and it moves off to the right. Normal square root moves off to the right. So if we start off by flipping it, so it's going this way, and then we move it two units to the right, we're going to go we're going to still be going right of that y-axis. We will move right of that y-axis. So when we move and then flip, we move this way, but then we flip into this location. But when we flip and then move, we start off going this way, but then we sort of flip into back this way, but then we move after that. So that's why we're seeing two totally different things. So the order we put the transformation on, we get totally different answers. So order really matters with our transformations. 
All right, let's start working some examples. So we want to give three transformations of f of x equals x cubed minus 2x plus 2. First thing, we shift it down by 5. So we'll do this in red. Shift it down by 5. So we do that. Remember, f of x, shift it down by 5, f of x minus 5, f of x plus k. So if we want to go down 5, it is negative 5 that we plug in for k. So f of x minus 5. So f of x minus 5 will give us some new function. Let's name this. So let's say it is g of x is equal to, I'll rewrite it so we can see more easily what's going on. g of x is equal to f of x minus 5 which would be x cubed minus 2x plus 2, our normal function, and then just minus 5. So we've got gx equals x cubed minus 2x plus, sorry, not plus, but minus 3, 2 minus 5, minus 3. And that's what we get for shifting down by 5. If we want to shift right by 2, then it's, let's make a new function. We'll call this one h of x. And then h of x is going to be equal to f, our original function, shifted right by 2. We do that by x plus k. Going to the right causes a negative k because we have to get that 0 to show up on the right now. So x plus k. So x plus k, it's x minus 2, since we're shifting to the right, equals, we plug in for our old x. Our old placeholder is now replaced by x minus 2. So x minus 2 cubed minus 2 times x minus 2 plus 2. And if we wanted to, so we could expand and simplify, but that's really not what the point of this lesson is about, expanding and simplification. I'm pretty sure you guys can handle that. And if you can't, we'll have other lessons where we're doing that more uh, carefully in polynomials. So we could expand if we wanted, you know, if we had to for the problem. Then finally, in green, we shift it left by 1, then up by 4, then flip vertically. So this is the most complicated one of all. We're going to start off by using g, h, and then finally we'll make it to k. So we'll cre treat each of these as one function after another. So we start off at f of x equals x cubed minus 2x plus 2. All right, now we're going to have a transformation that's going to be left by 1. So we do that by plugging in. So we plug in x plus 1, right? Positive k to move left if we're plugging in horizontally. So we've got a new function, g of x, that's equal to f plugged in x plus 1. And this is what happens if we just shift to the left. Equals x plus 1 cubed minus 2 times x plus 1 plus 2. Great. We could expand if we wanted to. We're not going to worry about that right now. Next, we move up by 4. So up by 4 is function plus 4. So let's call a new function. So it's h of x. And now we're doing this to g of x. So it's h of x is equal to g of x plus 4. And since g of x was equal to f of x plus 1, it's f of x plus 1 plus 4. So we've got what we had before, x plus 1 cubed minus 2 times x plus 1 plus 2. Great. Final one, we're going to name this function k, and now it is a flip vertically. So a flip vertical is a negative version of the function, just multiplying the function by negative, by negative 1. So k of x is the vertical flip of h of x. Remember, this has to happen in order, so we're doing it to h of x. So it's negative h of x. Now, what was h of x? Well, h of x was, so it's negative quantity. What did we have for h of x? We had g of x plus 4. So it's negative quantity g of x plus 4. And then what was g of x plus 4? So that was negative quantity f of x plus 1 plus 4. So we get, finally, negative quantity x plus 1 cubed minus 2 x plus 1. Oh, whoops, on the very one above that, sorry about that, I forgot to add on the 4. So we get plus 2 plus 4 or plus 6. Sorry about that one. So plus 6, so minus 2 quantity x plus 1 plus 6. Great. 
And there we are. We could continue to expand that if we wanted to, but that's ultimately what it's going to be. We'd have to expand a bunch of things, expand the, you know, the cube in there, and then uh, distribute out that negative sign. But that's pretty much what's going on. We just now have to do that all in the order that we're supposed to do. But it's important that we do it in the order of shift, the shift, by, shift to the left by one, then the shift up by four, then flip vertically. If we break that order, it's not going to wind up working out. We're going to get a different answer. Great. All right, next example. So we've got a parent function of cube root of x, and that's this guy on the left. Now we want to give the function for the graph on the right. So we need to figure out what things happen to the graph on the right. So the first thing it looks to me is that notice how we've got the right side is down and the left side is up. The way we do that is so it's first we've got a vertical flip. And what comes after that? The home base, in quotes, so home moves. Where was it originally? So it was originally at 0, 0. We'll make a home and say, that seems like a reasonable place to say where its home used to be. So its home used to be at 0, comma 0. And over the course of becoming the second graph, it goes to, where is its home? Here's 2, 1. So it's at 2, comma 1. So the home moves 2, comma 1, which means that we've got two things coming out of this. We've got a shift right by 2 and a shift up by 1. So we can come up with a, a function for this by just applying these transformations. So first we've got f of x. So let's do our first transformation. g of x equals vertical flip is negative f of x equals cube root of x. So this is our first part. But next, we have the second part that comes in. So second part, we'll call this one h of x, so that'll be what our final function actually is. h of x equals, we've got shifting right, shift right happens by x minus 2, remember x plus k, but we put in negatives to shift to the right. Shift up is just our function plus 1. Those two we can actually put in any order, they'll never wind up interacting with each other since the plus 1 happens completely outside of the function, outside of everything. So negative f of x, so we've got here h of x is equal to g plugging in x minus 2 and also shifting it up by 1. And now it, g of x is equal to negative f of x. So since g of x is equal to negative f of x, we have negative f of x, gx becomes f of x, so this here is just the same thing as negative f of x. So it's going to be negative f of x is cube root of x. So, oh, whoops, should be a negative sign there. So g of x minus 2 is negative f of x minus 2 plus 1 equal to negative cube root negative cube root of x minus 2 plus 1. So the function that we're seeing over here is h of x equals negative cube root of x minus 2 plus 1. Great. We want to, for this example, we want to give the parent function f and what transformations were applied and the order they were applied in to create g. So g of x equals 7 minus x cubed for the first one. So the first one, we'll do it in red. So what is the parent function that makes this up? Well, parent function for g of x in red is going to be f of x equals x cubed, right? We see that x cubed there, so it seems reasonable that that's going to be it. So what had to happen to be able to get 7 minus x cubed? Well, the first thing that had to happen is a vertical flip and then a vertical shift up. We could also have a vertical shift down and then a vertical flip of everything, but it's easier to see it as vertical flip. So vertical flip. And then the second thing is shift up by 7. And that's why we get negative x cubed from the vertical flip, and then shift up 7 will be negative x cubed plus 7, so we get 7 minus x cubed, and that's how we get our red g of x. Now our blue g of x 
10 square root x plus 5. So this f of x, we'll start from the basic function of square root x. That's our fundamental function. So what's happened in here? Let's say the first thing, it seems like it's easier to move horizontally than to have to do a vertical stretch first. It actually won't matter what order we do it in, but we're, let's say we'll do it in first order of shift. So we've got x plus 5 in there, so x plus 5, x plus k means it's a positive, so shift by 5 left. We'd say horizontal shift and it goes to the left because it's a positive k. And then the second thing we do is we multiply the entire function by 10. So it is a vertical stretch by a equals 10. And we actually could do that in the complete, completely opposite order. We could do vertical stretch by a equals 10 and we get 10 root x and then plug in x plus 5 and we get 10 times square root of x plus 5. So 1 or 2, it doesn't actually matter which one goes first. Unlike the red function, which actually it did matter that we had a vertical flip and then shift up by 7. We'd have to do a slightly different thing if we wanted to do it in a different order for the red function. But the blue function, anything. Finally, the green function, its basic parent function, what's creating it, its base function is absolute value of x. Now for this one, this is a little bit hard to see which one this has to be. It's much easier to start off by shifting to the right by 3 because we see right here this 2x. So 2x means that how the x-axis is being affected has been sped up. But if we speed up and then move by a different thing, well, we're used to moving. All of our theory about moving is based off of move first. Our, our, uh, our theory of moving how we experience the x-axis was all done on it starting as x and not starting as 2x or 5x or 1 half x. It was all based on x plus k, not 2x plus k. So we want to start off by shifting, doing our shifting, dealing with that first. So we will shift right by 6. And we know it's to the right because we've got a negative 6. Now here's actually the thing. It's not by 6. So this is a confusion. It seems to be 6 at first because that plus k, but notice what's really there? 2x minus 6, once again, we have things in the form x plus k. 2x minus 6 is not in the form x plus k. It's got 2x. It's not just 1x. So we have to get it to 1x first. So we pull out the 2, and we get 2 times quantity x minus 3. So the shift to the right is actually by this 3 here. So we shift right by 3 because we've got k at negative 3. And then our second one is a horizontal speed up by a equals 2, which is to say it will squish to half of its original horizontal length. Any horizontal interval will squish to half. And then finally, we've got this plus 1 here, so it shifts up by 1. Now it actually turns out that the 3 could be at the top or it could be at the bottom. It doesn't matter. Shifting up by 1, that could happen at the very beginning, could happen at the very end. But because of this shift right and a horizontal speed up, we have to have it in this x plus k form. So we can't get it out of 2x minus 6 because it's 2x plus k. That's not the same form. We have to have it as x plus k, so we have to pull that 2 out first. There is a way where we could have the horizontal speed up go first and then shift, but it's much easier to think in terms of the shift right and then the horizontal speed up. And if that one seemed a little confusing, I wouldn't worry about it too much. That's probably the absolute hardest kind of question of this type you'd ever see, at least for the next, you know, couple years till you're in college. Or if you're taking an advanced, not say just in college, but taking an advanced level math class in college. So don't really worry about this right here. This is a fairly difficult kind of problem. But this is the sort of thing you want to be thinking about it with. You want to be thinking in terms of what do I have to do here if I'm following that formula table, if I'm following that table, and you have to follow it carefully, what does it have to fit in? It has to fit in things of the form x plus k. And you notice 2x is different. It's not in that same form. So you have to get it into that form before you can use the stuff that we talked about before. All right. Final example. How is vertically stretching the graph of f of x equals x squared the same as horizontally stretching it? So remember, a vertical stretch, so vertical stretch is done by a times f of x. Horizontal stretch is done by f 
of a times x. Now, I think it's a little bit confusing to use a in two places. So instead, we're going to call this b. So we'll say, you know, we're just using b to prevent confusion. So don't worry about the fact that it's not what we were seeing before. It's not the same a multiplicative factor that we saw before. It means the exact same thing. a and b are both just constants. So a and b are multiplicative constants. They're just how much we're stretching by, whether it's a horizontal stretch or it's a vertical stretch. It's just how much we're stretching by. All right, so let's see how this works on f of x equals x squared. a times f of x, that's going to be a times x squared. f of b times x, that means b times x will plug in instead for the x. So we'll get bx in as the quantity squared. So over here we've got ax squared and b squared x squared, because the squared will get put onto both of them. So we've got these two things. So how is it that they're the same? Well, how is it that they're similar? What is the connection between them? Well, think about this. A is just a constant, and B is just a constant. So A and B are both constants. But if B is a constant, then that means that B squared is also just a constant, right? If b is 4, then b squared is just 16. So it will be a larger constant than b, but it's still just a constant. It's not allowed to vary around. So b squared is also a constant. So what that means here is in either case, whether it's vertical stretch or horizontal stretch, it just has the effect of multiplying x squared. Of multiplying x squared by a constant. So what we're seeing here, the reason why ax squared, why if we do a vertical stretch and we do a horizontal stretch, and if you go back and you looked at uh, what we saw when we saw a vertical stretch example and we saw the horizontal stretch example, you'll notice that they actually look basically the exact same. There are slight differences, but it's the same sort of stretching going on. Because when we compress it horizontally, it causes it to just sort of squirt up vertically. And when we stretch it out vertically, it's the same thing as if we'd compressed it horizontally. So in either case, whether it's a vertical stretch or a horizontal stretch, it's just the same as multiplying by a constant. So that's why they're so similar. The, we in actually pretty much, I think, all of the fundamental functions that we're used to using by this point, all of them are already things where this is just the, the horizontal and the vertical stretch will wind up having the same effect. It, it will do it by different amounts, but ultimately it's just putting a constant into the mix, multiplying things by a constant. The first time that you'll wind up seeing things, and right now, if you've even taken trigonometry, right now the only thing you'd see where you'd be able to see the difference between a horizontal and a vertical stretch is trigonometric functions. If you look at sine and cosine, it actually is possible to horizontally stretch those and vertically stretch those, and you'll get totally different looking things out of a vertical stretch versus a horizontal stretch. Now, it's okay that we haven't really talked about trigonometric functions yet, and you haven't seen them yet, probably. Don't worry about that. That's okay. And if you have seen trigonometric functions and you've taken some trigonometry, that's all the better. So you probably are already exposed to this. But just know that later on you will see cases where there is a difference between horizontal stretch and vertical stretch. But for some other functions, like f of x equals x squared, it winds up being that there's not really a difference at all. All right. Hope you now have a good understanding of all the different transformations that are available to us. I know there's a lot of them, but if you think through what you're doing with each one, you can probably figure it out without even having to resort to the table. And these are really useful because they let us build a bunch of different functions and understand how to graph functions that seem complex at first, but are really just some basic function we're used to graphing that's been stretched and squished and moved around. All right, we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.